So our, our next speaker is um, uh, Bolton Bailey from um, University of Illinois, a PhD student there, um, who is going to be talking about formalizing the soundness of SNARKs. All right, great, thank you. Uh, wait for the slides to appear. Okay, great. Okay, the slides seem to be up. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the formal SNARKs project uh, that I have been undertaking with myself and my advisor, Andrew. Um, so let me jump right into it. So uh, what am I talking about? Um, our project is basically to formally check, that means to computer check, these mathematical proofs of the soundness for uh, several SNARK systems that exist in the literature. Um, so why would we want to do this? Um, maybe the primary reason is because there have been bugs in implementations in the past. So there's the sort of famous Zcash bug in the sort of BCTB14 SNARK um, that, uh, as far as we know, was never exploited. But the main goal of this project is basically to um, design in hindsight in such a way that this bug would have been caught by our system. Another uh, reason that soundness is good in general for, um, for checking, soundness is a, a good target in general for formal methods is that it's not necessarily easy to catch a bug, a soundness bug in a snark in any other way, right? We're talking about the entire space of, of adversaries, right, all possible algorithms. Um, and it's not necessarily easy to do fuzz testing for that, uh, say. And then a, a third reason is that, you know, it's just good to systematize our knowledge of, of these proofs. Maybe it'll lead to new insights or, or ways of modifying constructions that we have. Uh, so how do we go about this? Um, we use the Lean Theorem Prover. It's a, uh, it's a tool for producing proofs. And we leverage the MATLAB library, which is this open source project of a lot of undergraduate level math. In particular, it has support for multivariable polynomials, which is useful for our purposes. And our approach is going to be to write tactics and automate these proofs in such a way that uh, people can then run them on their own SNARK constructions. So what type of SNARKs are the ones that are covered by our work here? Um, it's a very particular family uh, of SNARKs that use elliptic curve pairings. So this is uh, the, probably the most famous example is the Groth, the Groth 16 snark. Um, so how do these snarks work? Basically, everyone starts with a bunch of CRS elements, group elements in a set of one of three groups. Um, so we have G1, powers of G1, G2. Um, and the idea is that individuals are going to be able to compute products in this group exponent using a pairing function uh, that exists. So you can take an element of the first group, an element of the second group, and sort of multiply them into an element of the third group. What is the cryptographic model behind the, the theorems that we're proving, right? Almost all of cryptography relies on some kind of model. And in our case, we're using what's called the algebraic group model. Um, so this is a cryptographic idea that basically says, you know, Alice has, you know, G1, G1 to the tau, G1 to the tau squared. Um, she can, uh, obviously, by just doing the group operation, the elliptic curve group operation, she can add these elements to get new exponents. But essentially, she can not make group elements in any other way. Um, so the, the basic idea is that any um, group element that Alice produces is going to have to be some linear combination of the, the CRS elements that she's given beforehand. Um, and if that is the assumption that we have, what is the goal that we're trying to prove from this assumption? Well, it's the, the knowledge soundness, right? So if Alice makes a successful proof, we're trying to prove that she knew the witness in some sense. And what does it mean to know the witness? Well, in the AGM, it's sort of a, a simple way of expressing that is to say that from the coefficients that we know that Alice knows, we can prove that we can get from those coefficients the witness. So to put it all together, uh, 
the CRS generator is going to sample some random field elements from the, from the sort of the base field of these, of these groups. It's going to then use those field elements to generate CRS elements by taking the generators of the groups and raising them to the powers of, of various field elements, maybe, um, maybe making linear comb combinations of those. These CRS elements are gonna be passed to the prover and the verifier. The prover uh, will then make linear combinations of her own of those CRS elements, and these are gonna be the proof elements, right? In the case of Groth16, there are only three uh, proof elements. In some of the older SNARKs, there are more. Um, with these proof elements, right, they're gonna take the form of, of generators to the powers of multivariable polynomials in the, in the field elements as sort of abstract variables. So the verifier is going to have all of these group proof elements. Uh, the verifier can check some equations on them. And that these equations hold essentially implies that these multivariable polynomials in the exponent um, are going to be equal to some other set of multivariable polynomials, or they'll be equal to zero, something like that. And this basically relies on the, the Schwartz-Zippel lemma, which, which then tells us that if we're evaluating this multivariable polynomial at these random field elements, tau, sigma, whatever, um, then the polynomials themselves are highly likely to be equal. So uh, the, the thing that we need to prove is that given these equalities of polynomials, um, we should be able to, to extract, uh, successfully extract the knowledge from the, uh, from the coefficients. So um, to give you a sort of walkthrough of this, I've prepared this extremely simple snark. Uh, it's not really a snark because it's not even complete. It's not even possible that, it's able to, that this snark is able to prove the things that uh, the thing that it is wanting to prove, but it's definitely the case that this snark is sound, right? So it's definitely not possible for the prover to trick the verifier. So, okay, so let me sort of explain how this snark works. This is just a, uh, even more cut down than, than Groth 16, even more cut down than baby snark. Um, this, is the, this is like the, simple, the, the simplest entry point to, to how snarks work. So we're gonna say that there are two witness elements that the prover knows, uh, A and B. And the, the verifier is going to know these three um, statement elements, C, D, and E. And these are all um, members of some field. And all that we want to prove about these five field elements is that either A times D is equal to E or B times C is equal to E. And so we're gonna prepare a, a, a snark, quote unquote snark to do this. Um, it's gonna have two unknown field elements. We're, we'll call them alpha and beta. And there will just be three CRS group elements, g to the alpha, g to the beta, and g to the alpha beta. Um, and I guess we'll, from now on, we'll just sort of refer to them as alpha, beta, and alpha, beta. Um, we'll, we'll ignore the fact that all of these things are, are, are always represented as exponents in a group. And what the prover is going to return is the group element A times alpha plus B times beta, right? So the prover knows A, prover knows B, so she can construct uh, this, this new group element. And then the verifier is going to check the following equation. The verifier is gonna use the pairing to multiply A alpha plus B beta and C alpha plus D beta. And she, the verifier is going to check that this is equal to E alpha beta. So that is the, the single check that the verifier will do. Um, so that's, that's all the verifier knows. And what we want to prove is that this implies uh, the goal. So the step zero of the sort of automation process for all of this is to load this assumption in uh, into lean. So for any coefficients that the adversary generates, we have for all of these A, B, C, D, and E, which are field elements, we have A times alpha plus B times beta uh, times C times alpha plus D times beta is equal to E times alpha times beta. That is the assumption that we have, and the goal that we want to prove is this statement A times D equals E or B times C equals E. Um, so, so when you sort of boil out the, the assumptions about the model and everything like that, it, it sort of 
becomes a very s simple problem of working with these multivariable polynomials. So what is the first step in this automatic proof? Um, the first step is to, to, you know, isolate the coefficients and put things in a more normal form. So uh, we all remember the first outside, inside, last rule, right, the FOIL rule. We can do distributivity of addition over multiplication. We see that A times alpha plus B times beta times C times alpha plus D times beta, that's just the same thing as A times C times alpha squared plus A times D plus B times C times alpha times beta plus B times D times beta squared. And that is in fact going to be equal to E times alpha times beta. So that's our new assumption and, and that can be carried out by um, one, of, one of many tactics provided by MathLib that just puts, um, ex uh, puts expressions in a ring into normal form. Uh, so what do we do next once we have isolated the coefficients? The next thing we're going to do is we're just going to reason about what does it mean for two polynomials to be equal, right? So two polynomials are just equal if their coefficients are equal for, for every monomial term, right? So, so what does it mean to say that this, this long polynomial is equal to E times alpha times beta? Well, the coefficient of alpha squared on the left-hand side is A times C, and the coefficient of alpha squared on the right-hand side is zero. So that gives us that A times C has to equal zero. That, that's what one, that's what the alpha squared coefficient uh, gives us. Similarly, if we look at the alpha times beta coefficient, we get that A times D plus B times C is gonna equal to E, because E is the alpha times beta coefficient on the, on the right-hand side. And then from the beta squared coefficient, we get that B times D is equal to zero. Uh, so those are our new assumptions. What do we do once we have these new assumptions? Well, we can start to simplify. Um, so notice that A, C, B, D, and E, they're all field elements. And what is, what is one thing that's true of a field? Well, there are no zero divisors. Um, and so that means that if A times C is equal to zero, that just means that either A is equal to zero or C is equal to zero, right? This is just a fact that's true of, of, of integers as well, right? Um, so we can simplify all these, these multiplications being equal to zero, we can simplify them into cases. Uh, so we're gonna change the A times C equals zero into A equals zero or C equals zero, and the B times D equals zero is gonna be changed into B equals zero or D equals zero. And note again that this is something that is entirely possible to do automatically, right? We can, we can scan each one of these, um, these uh, expressions here, see if it's of the form something times something else is equal to zero, and if that's the case, then we can make this, this split happen. And then all we have to do is uh, some case work. Uh, so A is equal to zero or C is equal to zero. From that, we have to prove the goal that's the same as proving the goal when A is equal to zero and proving the goal when C is equal to zero. So basically we, we just split things into cases. We have one case where A is equal to zero, we have one case where C is equal to zero, and we can recursively now simplify both, both of these cases. So what does it look, to look like to simplify here? Well, we can use the fact that A equals zero to rewrite all the instances of A that we see in our other hypotheses, right? We can turn this A into a zero, and similarly, we can turn this C into zero on the, on the, in the case two where C is equal to zero. Um, and then those can be eliminated. Uh, and we just get that in case one, B times C is equal to E. And in case two, A times D is equal to E. Um, and now we're done, right? Because uh, in case one, we have B times C is equal to E. That's one of the two things we're, that we're allowed to prove for our goal. That's just the right-hand side of the, of the or expression in our goal. And A times D is equal to E, that's just the, the left-hand side of the or expression. So in either one of these cases, it looks like we've proved our goal, and, and that is a complete automated proof of the, of the soundness for this snark. Okay, so um, now I guess I'll discuss some of the more technical aspects that, um, that have been swept under the rug in that sort of simple toy, like, toy example. So uh, I mentioned that uh, the snarks are based on pairings. So it is the case that we, we, we do see a lot of the, the splits I was talking about, right? Because, um, 
because the pairings are, are always sort of multiplications with, with a left-hand side and a right-hand side, they're multiplications of two things, all these polynomials typically have degree two in the, in the set of variables they're operating over. And so we do see that it's pretty common that we can, uh, we can do this sort of simplification into an or statement. Um, and doing this, this recursive process of locating or statements and doing cases on them and simplifying and finding more or statements, um, that, will, uh, that will completely solve uh, many snarks. And for some other snarks, it will not completely solve it because there will be some hitch or complication that requires us to, to do a little bit of casework. Um, so to take an, the example of the growth 16, if you do 37 recursive calls um, to, this, to this, um, this or simplification process, uh, I, think, I think you'll be left with uh, eight or so um, special cases that you need to solve by hand. Um, and so, or I guess, well, it's, it's different from, for the, um, for different versions of Growth 16, but in, in one version of Growth 16, there's, there's one critical case that needs to be solved, and in another, there's, there's a few more. Um, here's another additional complication that sort of comes up. In the example, I just had, you know, five field elements, uh, A, B, C, D, and E, right? But in reality, we're talking about proof systems that operate over over abstract instances of, of R1CS, or, or quadratic arithmetic programs. And so we actually have, you know, arbitrarily long sums of, of various polynomials in, in one of the, the CRS elements. But because of the way that these snarks are structured, uh, it turns out that once we've factored out all of the, the sort of bounded degree CRS elements from these sums, uh, we just have, you know, a sum that usually has some constant polynomial term, right? And because, you know, essentially, because in this expression above, C of H could, could essentially be anything, it's sort of equivalent to just, say, to just treating this entire sum expression as, as an atom. So, so basically, this is to say that we could replace this sum expression here with just, uh, we, we could find this sum expression every time it appears in our hypotheses and just replace it with, with a, with a simple variable, and then we could carry out the proof from there, and the proof would go, go through just fine. Um, yep, so that's an additional complication, but it's, it's something that uh, turns out to be not too hard to solve. Um, so to talk a little bit about the, um, the snarks that we have covered in our, in our sort of work here, um, there's the original growth 16, that's probably the, the most well known, and that's the one that takes the, the longest time to compile. Why does Gross 16 take, take so long to compile compared to these other ones? Uh, it takes a few hours as opposed to only a few minutes. Um, well, the, the thing about Gross 16 is it, it's actually des designed to be secure in, in a model where you can sort of pass between the first two groups, right? So it, it's, it's not, um, it's designed to be secure in more than, than what are called type three uh, pairings. Um, and because of that's a sort of uh, design constraint on Growth 16, and the sort of downstream consequence of that design constraint is that the proof actually involves a lot of steps that, uh, that make a sort of without loss of generality approach, right? There, there are a lot of symmetries in the, in the Growth 16 snark, and there are a lot of symmetries in the proof. Um, so if you're writing a paper proof, it, it's actually pretty simple to just say without loss of generality, either this really complicated expression is zero or this really complicated expression is zero. But if you're, if you're doing what we do with the wanting to have something that's a little bit more automatic, um, it becomes the case that you, uh, you, you want to just not worry about so much about the, the without loss of generality expression and you just want to do the casework for both sides, which leads to a bit of an exponential blow up in the amount of time that it takes to prove. Um, but on the other hand, you know, it's, it's a, the, the proof itself is not that long, and it turns out to be manageable to just run, the, um, run through both cases on both sides of this without loss of generality statement. Uh, turns out that the, the simplest uh, snark to compile is this baby snark um, that uh, my advisor, Andrew, is a co-author on. That's, that's one that's really designed to be as simple as possible. Um, 
it's sort of designed as an educational snark. It's, it's actually not as efficient in terms of performance as some of these other snarks, uh, partly because it relies on quadratic arithmetic programs, but it's, it's interesting to see that, you know, one of the snarks that is sort of designed to be like uh, simple to learn actually is also simple to prove things about. Um, so did we find any bugs? The, the big question, no, we didn't actually find any bugs, but I guess I will take a moment to, to you know, say my piece about the, the, the process of going through these proofs in order to sort of tweak, uh, tweak the proofs in order to make them work within the formal system. Um, there, is, there are some things that are worth mentioning in terms of the amount of rigor that you see in some of the, the papers that prove these things. For example, here's a, here's a sort of line uh, from the original Growth 16 paper. Um, it, it makes a statement about a particular uh, term, which involves a bunch of sums, and it says that the, ter the terms in alpha times, you know, this long sum over delta equal to zero, and that shows us that um, that is true for this other long sum. Now, if you were just reading this, like, uh, like I was the first time that I was trying to prove this, uh, I sort of took this to mean that, okay, the alpha over delta coefficient is equal to zero, the alpha squared over delta coefficient is equal to zero, um, and the alpha beta over delta coefficient is equal to zero. All of those things are equal to zero for this particular polynomial that's sort of implied in the proof. But that's not actually the case. In fact, the, the real proof that, that this expression is equal to zero, it, it involves more casework. Um, and there's, there's a later sort of revisiting of the, of the growth 16 snark uh, by Pagari et al. That, 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 sh that walks through this casework and shows that it's a little bit more complicated. Um, so, you know, that led to a, a moment of panic for me. I was like, I like called up Andrew, I was like, oh my God, growth 16 is broken. Um, but, uh, but ultimately there was no problem and the snark was able to prove things just fine. But I do sort of worry about how this could come to be misinterpreted in later, paper, later papers. So for example, here's this table from a later paper. And the, the way that this table is written, it sort of assumes that, the, that this statement up here in growth 16, this is, this is another snark that is sort of based off of growth 16. And it just sort of assumes that this statement about all of these coefficients being actually equal to zero is true. Um, and now luckily this other snark still seems to be sound due to sort of a coincidence with um, how some of the exponents for the, uh, for, the, for the toxic waste elements were chosen, but that could easily have not been the case. Um, so I guess I'll uh, conclude with, with mentioning some, you know, some possible future work. Um, you know, there are, there are one, one thing that would be nice would, would be to do these things in the literature of transforming uh, snarks into the other. This is something that you just sometimes see and it's, it's sometimes convenient. For example, a lot of these snark papers talk about Laurent polynomials. These are polynomials where you can have negative exponents. And that's just sort of complicated to, to reason about. I mean, I would, rather, I would much rather just be using generic multivariable polynomials. And because of that, I would rather just multiply through everything by, a nom by a, some monomial so that all of these exponents are positive. Um, and so, right, so for example, we have, a, we have a snark transformation proof that sort of proves that this is a, a, a legal operation. This is something that you can do to transform one snark into another. Um, Another thing that you could do is maybe if you have multiple toxic waste elements, you could collapse them into one toxic waste element by just talking about powers of a single element suitably chosen. Uh, so these are a bunch of uh, snark transformations you could formalize. We're thinking about formalizing others. And you know, you could go even further. You could talk about um, formalizing you know, proofs of other systems. You could talk about Planck or even Stark systems. I work for, for risk zero these days and, and I'm working on a on a, on a proof for them of their sort of Stark system. There's a, there's a lot of sort of directions you could go with this in terms of you know, making, uh, making these proof systems secure um, and providing sort of confidence uh, that, the, that the literature is correct. Um, anyway, so thanks, for, thanks everyone for listening. Here's a QR code of the GitHub repo. Thank you, Bolton. Um, so we have a few um, 
minutes for questions. I guess maybe I'll ask the, 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 the first question. So for me, this, this paper was kind of a break for a breath of fresh air, and I, you know, proving that it could be done for Graph 16. I guess my question is, like, how, how much effort is it to, to, to learn how to use the tool, and how painful is it to, um, to, to, to go apply them to these proof systems, and like, how much more work do we need to get, for example, plant in stocks? Right, yeah, so it's a good question. Um, Right, so I think I, I started learning the tool, right? I, I didn't know too much about Lean, actually, before starting this project. Um, Lean is a very nice tool, and then it's sort of very beginner-friendly. It only took a few months to learn. Uh, the biggest hump was proving, you know, the, the first snark, because um, I had to sort of formulate the, the cryptographic model that was being used and, and see how it was, how I could correctly load that into, the, into Lean. Um, once I understood that, uh, it was relatively straightforward to prove these other snarks because I was basically just using the same process that I used before. Um, to talk about like uh, you know approaches for other snarks, right? Like Planck, you mentioned, right? Right. Some of these have more complicated cryptographic models, right? And so, right, they rely both on the fiat sh Shamir transform and on uh, elliptic curve pairings. So. I would say like the more complicated the cryptographic model is, that's probably the single most important factor for the, the complication that you see in the code that you write. Um, yeah, but thanks. Question? Hey, uh, I'm just wondering if uh, for handling the exponential blow up because of uh, without loss of generality arguments, um, would it be possible to like do away with that by doing some kind of appropriate alpha renaming of the variables? Uh, by doing a what for the for the like sorry? alpha renaming, so you have like two way, two formulas that look very similar, right? And then you replace the variables names, right? Yeah, so you could definitely think about uh, automatically matching them somehow. Um, I imagine that would be possible. It's just yeah, it right matching uh, matching expressions sometimes takes a, a long time, and it's it's not necessarily obvious how to do it automatically. So I imagine that you could do that, and, and probably um, if you wanted to, to spend a bit of time figuring out the right way to, to point out the symmetries in the proof, uh, you could get Lean to understand it, and you would cut a lot of time off of your proof. Um, but it's, it's hard to see uh, being able to do that just sort of in a generic way for, for any snark completely automatically. Yeah, some sort of like simplification and then sorting probably can do that. Right. Kind of some, time. Yeah, so I, I suppose that might work. But um, the thing is, there are these, um, yeah, I think, let, let me think about that a little bit. Right, you could, you could sort all of the expressions, but you, you would also probably want to put them in some kind of normal form. Um, before you did that. So yeah, maybe, maybe what you're suggesting would actually work, yeah. If you, if you, uh, you, would, you would have to do a little bit of, of simplification. The thing is that you would probably have to make sure that everything was multiplied out. You would have to do this after the, the sort of step one process of, um, of sort of putting, putting the polynomial in a normal form, I think. Um, yeah, so I mean, in the toy snark example that I gave, it was, it was a pretty short um, polynomial, but in reality, like for, for growth 16, there are, you know, there are probably, there are like 18 CRS elements um, for some of these. And so that means that there are 18 squared terms in this sort of fully multiplied out polynomial. So they're, they're rather large objects. Um, but I think it is possible to do what you're suggesting. Yeah. All right. Hello. Um, I worked in, or I worked with Lean before. Kudos to you. It's top. Um, and cool. I just wanted to ask, so in the example, I think we kind of proved that basically if this constraint holds, then the computation of the snark is correct, right? No, no. So mm -hmm. yeah, okay. definitely what, what we are doing is something distinct from the, the so-called like correctness of the mm -hmm. snark. Um, yeah, it, it has nothing to do with saying that if I, if I produce, a, uh, if I produce a proof honestly, then that, uh, honest proof will verify correctly. Um, that's another thing that you could formalize. It, it would, in theory, probably be easier because you would just have to sort of push through the, um, the assumptions about how the, the snark was constructed. Um, but yeah, so that, that, that would be, 
that would be like the, the next component in sort of making a fully verified snark that, that literally describes all of the properties that a smark, snark is supposed to have. Okay, got you. So then for the, I guess, the things you listed in the table, um, what statements do those refer to? Uh, you mean this table? Yes. Yeah, so the number of toxic samples is the, the number of field elements, right? These are the alphas and the betas. The proof elements, the number of proof elements is the number of elements um, in the proof. So for example, growth 16, the prover sends three group elements to the, um, to the verifier. Um, mm -hmm. The SRS element sets, this, um, this, is to, this, this is another way of talking about the, the CRS, right? It's yes. the number of, of different components. Yeah, um, but, um, of the CRS, yeah. Sorry, but I guess like what is the actual statement that is being like compiled and proven in lean for each of these compile times? Right, so the, the statement that's being proven in lean is the statement that if this, uh, this, large, um, this large sequence of, of polynomial equalities holds true, multivariable polynomial equalities holds true, then that implies that the, um, that the like the rank, the rank one constraint system, for for example, is satisfied, right? So there's a formalization of what it means for a rank one constraint system to be satisfied, and right. and that is what is proven. For Specifically, it's proven for the the extractor, right? So we we define an extractor. We say the extractor is um, it, it's actually very simple. The extractor is always just this particular CRS, the the coefficient for this particular CRS element, mm -hmm. and we say we we prove that. Um, this equality of polynomials implies that uh, the, the extractor, when passed to the rank one constraint system, satisfies the rank one constraint system. Okay, I see. Thank you. Thank you, Bolton. We're out of time, so okay. let's thank Bolton again. Yeah. Our next speaker, uh, Benedict Boons uh, from Espresso Systems, is going to be uh, talking about proof carrying data, PCD, uh, without succinct uh, arguments, without snarks. Oh. Okay, great. Um, I think I have the last talk of the day, so I can talk forever, however long I want to, but no, I'll try to keep things short, which is exactly the topic of the talk namely succinct arguments, and how we can get proof-carrying data without succinct arguments. And this is joint work with Alessandri Keza, Pratyush Mishra, who's here, uh, William Lin, and Nick Spooner. But if we dissect the title, you know, very technical title, what does that actually mean? Well, proof-carrying data is the academic term for what is often called recursive snarks. Um, and I'll go into a little bit more why this is called recursive snarks. But succinct arguments, what is a SNARK? Well, SNARK is our favorite acronym here. It means succinct ar uh, non-interactive arguments of knowledge. So really what the title is saying, uh, recursive SNARKs without SNARKs, which seems a little bit odd uh, and should strike you as odd, but I hope at the end of the talk you will see how that is actually possible. So let's start with a little bit of motivation. And the motivation comes exactly from the space. We want to verify the blockchain history. So what does a blockchain look like? Well, it has some initial state. We call that a genesis block. There's the entire transaction history. So this is all of the blocks that have happened. And then there's the final state. And really what I care about as a user is the final state. I want to know how much money I have. I want to know that if someone sends a transaction that they had enough money to send this transaction. So the problem, though, if, if I download a blockchain or if I want to check the final state, really what I need to do is I join the system and I need to download everything, right? I, need to, I get this claim that this final state is correct, and either I trust that final state because, you know, someone gave it to me and I trust that person, or I must download the entire transaction history and sequentially apply every single transaction that has ever happened to the state and then check whether the final state matches what was claimed. Well, the problem is that this requires downloading hundreds of gigabytes. I, I think in Ethereum it's, it's probably ter terabytes, right? Like, um, and it takes, uh, you know, this would take over a month on, on consumer hardware. Um, and there's been actually a lot of work happening and even making this process faster because it is so vital to the security of blockchains but it inherently seems like a very difficult thing, especially as we're all working on making blockchains more scalable and have more transactions per second, this problem will only become worse. 
This also is extremely harmful to decentralization because what happens? Well, my phone is never going to download hundreds of gigabytes of data and it's never going to uh, spend hours, you know, like draining my battery. Well, what really happens is I just trust someone else, right? I use some service provider, I use some other layer, but this hurts decentralization. It means that really we can only run uh, full nodes, these fully verifying nodes, on more powerful server clusters. However, there is a solution that has been around and it, it, it does revolve around snarks. We can get the succinctness from the snark. So what does that look like? Well, consider the blockchain transition function. So really what it, this means, this function f, it, it basically just says that the transaction is applied correctly. So in Ethereum, f would be the EVM and you know, a state would be the, the state of the blockchain. It would check between one transaction and the next transaction that the EVM was applied correctly. So what I can do is we could have a powerful server that generates a snark, so this is a succinct proof that is efficiently verifiable, which simply says that this entire computation, so these, these, these uh, hundreds of gigabytes of transaction data, that that was applied correctly. So that uh, all of the, the transitions are correct and that the final state is valid. And this is amazing because then I only, as a client, I only need to download this proof which can be, as we saw in the last slide, it can be hundreds, you know, a few hundred bytes, or I think probably, yeah, 200 bytes is like the, the shortest snark. I just need to check these 200 bytes, it takes milliseconds, and then I'm convinced that the current state is valid. Well, the problem with this, so why doesn't this happen? Well, the problem with this is that if I do this for one block, and then the next block comes along, well, I just need to recompute the entire proof. So this powerful server, right, has to spend all this time generating this proof, and well then, you know, one more block happens, so six seconds later, they need to, you know, generate a new proof. And it's very unlikely that on a consumer hardware, if this process takes uh, months, that you can generate a new proof within six seconds, and again, you know, the problem gets more and more complicated the more blocks the, and the more data this blockchain has. So luckily, there is even a solution to this, and this is where incremental verifiable computation or recursive snarks come in. And the idea of incremental verifiable computation is exactly that, that I have here, right, this is a special type of function here, a special type of computation that I'm proving, namely it's the same function, f applied t times over and over again. So it's an incremental computation, um, and the, the idea of incrementally verifiable computation is that I can advance the proof in the same rate or at the same rate that I can uh, incrementally advance the computation. So I start uh, with some state S0, I apply the function to it, I get S1, S2, S3, and at every point I also have a proof which I also advance. So I have some proof pi i here in the middle, and then I apply this special prover which both advances the state and advances the function. And proof carrying data is the generalization of this to not just a line graph, so you know, blockchain we have a chain, but you know, if I have a DAG or, or any sort of more, more interesting computation, then this is called proof carrying data. So how do I get uh, this succinct blockchain uh, from IVC? Well, I would now basically have the powerful server generate the IVC proof that the latest state is valid with respect to F. And the big change here is now that the work of the server is independent on how many, um, the, the idea of these IVC systems is that I can always update the proof and basically the cost of updating the proof is independent or at most maybe logarithmic of uh, the, the, the number of computation steps that I've had before. Um, so the, if I get a server that is powerful enough to ever prove one block correct, then it should be enough to uh, prove all of the blocks correct because we can just apply the same thing over and over again. Um, and the user can just check the final proof, which is much less than T and much less than downloading the history and also the prover's work, and also the prover's memory, by the way, is uh, much less. So um, this is actually being used. So this is used in Mina today um, and also other blockchain and blockchain systems are using this, but improvements to IVC, which also have many other uh, 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 applications, would directly improve the efficiency and the security of many blockchain systems today. Because how do we construct IVC? Well, traditionally, we construct IVC from snarks, from these recursive snarks, 
In particular, in BCTT13, it was shown how to construct IVC from SNARKs with uh, succinct verification, so something like ROS16. And the, uh, concretely, this is realized with so-called cycles of pairing-friendly curves. So I need to get some special curves, which are you know, pairs of each other, in order to make the system um, efficient. And then in uh, COS20, it was showed that it's actually sufficient to not have a SNARK that has polylogarithmic verification, but you can actually get this from, from any SNARK that has sublinear verification. So already here, we've seen, uh, after six or seven years, we've seen a, a significant relaxation on the requirement uh, to, to build IVC, right? And the goal is gonna be in this talk to relax and relax the requirement of what we need in order to construct IVC. So the problem that SNARKs suitable for efficient IVC are difficult to construct. So, right, like they use these cycles of elliptic curves and, and also they often use trusted setups and, and uh, this makes both the, the practical performance and the theoretical analysis uh, complicated. So can we construct IVC from simpler primitives? Um, uh, so the, the, the idea is that, so what we showed in, in um, BCMS 20 for the first time is that we can actually construct IVC from a SNARK, so still a short proof, that does not have sublinear verification, but instead have something called a sublinear accumulation scheme. So concretely, this is a bulletproof type SNARK, which is short in proof size, but actually does not have uh, sublinear verification time. And this is based on ideas that were originally proposed in, in, in the work of HALO, which you know, is, is um, really has some, some genius ideas of how to you know, uh, get these uh, succinct, uh, these, uh, get IVC from something that is not a full-blown snark with su uh, succinct verification. And then in this work, we're wondering, do you even need a snark? So concretely here, we're focusing on the short proof size. Do I even need something that has a short proof? And what we show is that we can introduce something called a split accumulation scheme and it turns out that if I have a NARC, so not a SNARK anymore, which is just a non-interactive argument of knowledge, but it may be large, um, but it has the split accumulation scheme associated with it, well, then I can build IVC just from that. So there's no succinctness necessary. So a NARC with split accumulation is something significantly weaker than a full-blown SNARK. And this isn't just theoretically interesting, although it is theoretically interesting that we can build it from this weaker, it also turns out that we can design really efficient and elegant NARCs with succinct accumulation. So in particular, we can build a scheme that is secure in the, under the discrete logarithm assumption in the random oracle model. These are some of the most basic assumptions that we have and that we use, and uh, that has an accumulation verifier that is basically constant size. So it does, I think, you know, the total number of group scalar multiplications ends up being three. So it's really, really concretely efficient, and it doesn't require any sort of trusted setup, so we don't have to use, uh, and it doesn't require FFT, so we can make it, you know, practically, it's a really, really efficient uh, system. Um, by the way, this split accumulators, you may have heard of accumulators, set accumulators. Uh, this is different from set accumulators. This is a split accumulation scheme. Um, I will skip over this slide, but basically this is the general setup of how we build things. We build this NARC from a simple Sigma protocol, and then we build an accumulation scheme for this NARC. And uh, the, the, the one important thing is that everything we build, we, it turns out that if you add zero knowledge to the basic components of the scheme, then the final IVC uh, um, construction also turns out to be zero knowledge. So the properties carry through. Also, if you had something, a quantum secure snark, uh, a NARC here at the bottom, and a quantum secure accumulation scheme, then the final construction would also be quantum secure. So what about concrete uh, efficiency, right? You know, if ever you see an O in front of one, you should be very uh, suspicious because there might be, you know, uh, 10 million hidden under there. So what about concrete efficiency? Well, we actually implemented uh, this system, and, and by we, I mean uh, William and Pratush really led the effort on this, but in the amazing Artworks ecosystem, which we heard about yesterday, 
um, which is this set of ZK Snarks library. And in fact, we built two new libraries, and they're open source available. You can play around with them, Arc Accumulation and Arc PCD. Um, and it turns out that uh, in this work, our, our IVC construction, it can work from any sort of cycle, so it doesn't need any sort of FFT friendliness. Um, it's a completely trusted setup, and the recursive circuit is, is uh, really, really small. And in fact, the O that is hidden under here is about, I think, the, the recursive circuit, I think it's about 20,000 gates, 10,000, 4,000, 3,000 gates? Three, okay, something like that. <laughs> Between zero and, you know, 10,000, um, <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, which is way more efficient than, than anything that existed before. Um, so how do we do this? Well, uh, we built this, so let's look at IVC a little bit more detail and, and how it was traditionally built. So the idea of IVC is that you have, again, this prover which takes some state as input, this is Z here, takes an old proof as, as input, and also an additional optional witness uh, information as input, and outputs the new state, Z prime, and the new proof, uh, pi prime. So it updates both the state and the proof. And the verifier just takes as input the final state and the final proof, and can, can verify that the function was correctly applied t times. Um, and for the prover, we then can always, right, it's incremental, so we can always feed the output back into the uh, prover. I'll skip for now over the, the, def the security definitions, but one really important efficiency definition is this would be trivial to construct if I could simply, you know, concatenate the proofs, right? I just do this, and then, you know, I just concatenate the proofs with each other. Um, but the important efficiency requirement is actually that the proofs do not grow. So if I have some sort of proof size in the beginning, then I want to end up with a proof that is exactly the same size. Uh, and this implies that even if I do this for t steps, I end up with something uh, that is independent of t. So what is a ZK NARC? Well, it's a SNARC without the S, but let's look at a very particular ZK NARC. Um, or, uh, sorry, the definition for ZK NARC is that it's a proof for some circuit, so this is a, uh, and I have some inputs, some pri public inputs X and some private inputs W, and the NARC wants to show that there exists a W such that uh, C of X comma W is equal to one. So the prover here, this is the very similar to the SNARK scenario, uh, the prover here has the circuit available, the, the, so the function that is being computed, the public input and the witness, and provides a proof to the verifier, which only has the circuit and the public input available. Um, and it's a proof of knowledge, which very informally means that if I provide a proof and the verifier accepts this proof, well, then the prover must have really known this witness, right? That is the, that is the very informal way of, of saying that it is a proof of knowledge. Optionally, if the proof is small, so if it's much smaller than C, then that's what we call a snark. But in a NARC, we don't have this requirement. We can also make this zero knowledge, and zero knowledge means that, or some NARCs are zero knowledge, and zero knowledge means that the proof reveals no information about the witness uh, whatsoever. Um, oftentimes, there's also, the, the prover has a so-called proving key and a verification key uh, available. This is related to the pre-processing, uh, something that we also just heard a lot about in the last talk. So how do I get IVC from recursive snarks? This is why, why people call IVC oftentimes recursive snarks, because that has been for many years the main construction of how to get uh, IVC. Well, the idea is simply that I will, or maybe not simply, it is that I will implement a circuit which includes the snark verifier. So I will have a circuit which includes the, the function f, so checks that the function f was applied correctly once, and it also makes sure that the previous proof was correct, uh, correct. And the way it does that is by literally taking the verifier, so the verifier is an algorithm, it then turns that into a circuit, so into usually you know, addition and multiplication gates, and makes sure that checking that this verifier was, was run correctly. And by doing that, um, uh, and providing a snark proof, I get as output, well, both zt plus one, so the function evaluation, 
and the new proof, right? Because I've just proved that the old proof was correct and that the function was evaluated correctly. This is why it's a recursive snark, right? It's because by finally then checking this final proof, I check that it, it implicitly says that there must have existed a proof before that which was checked indirectly as part of the circuit and which means there must have been a proof before that which was checked and so on and so forth. This is why we call this uh, recursive snarks. And at the end, the final uh, verifier can just take in the first state and the f last state and the final proof. Um, completeness and soundness uh, follow from, from the snark uh, properties, although soundness is always a little bit tricky to actually, to actually get right. Um, uh, you need some really strong properties for the, for the snark. Um, and efficiency is just, well, what is the final output? Well, it's just the, simply the size of the snark proof. Um, and the reason why this works, so why does this not blow up, blow up, or why do I have this sublinearity? Well, you know, if I, the snark has some overhead, and, and converting something to a circuit uh, has some overhead. But it turns out if the snark verifier is constant size, let's think about the simplest case, cross 16. The snark verifier is the same complexity no matter, you know, how complex of a statement I'm proving. So this does not grow, right? This is really important that this thing here doesn't grow because uh, the, the, the snark verifier is just a constant size circuit. If I know that the gross 16 verifier is 100,000 gates, then it's 100,000 gates no matter how complicated the statement is that I'm proving. Turns out even if I just have sublinear verification, this also works, but it's a bit more complicated. Um, so the new tool that we're introducing here, um, and we want to basically now get the same thing, but from NARCs. And how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to introduce a new tool called accumulation, and in particular, split accumulation. I'll first talk about accumulation, or atomic accumulation. Um, and the idea is that I have a bunch of things that I want to check. So in our case, the thing that you want to keep in mind is that I have this long computation, and essentially, I want to check the proofs at every step of the computation. So this is, these are these QI. And the predicate basically makes sure that, that these proofs at every step of the computation are correct. So the final thing that I want to prove is that all of these proofs have been verified. And I can just check them each individually. And uh, well, this just you know, is exactly what I want to, want, to, want to do. But the idea with atomic accumulation is that I can accumulate these checks into a so-called accumulator. And instead of fully checking them at once, I accumulate them into an accumulator, and I check the final accumulator at the end. So how does this work? Well, I start with some accumulator. I have an accumulation prover, which takes as input the older accumulator and the state, and basically accumulates these things together into A1, and so on and so forth, and does this for T steps. And then there exists an accumulation verifier, which only has to check now not the original statement, right? You can see here the size of the boxes is not by accident, right? Phi is bigger than V, because checking phi is more expensive than checking, uh, than, than doing V. And the idea here is that the accumulation verify only has to check the update from uh, one accumulator to the next one. So this is much, much cheaper. But then I still have this final accumulator uh, at the end. And what I have to do is basically I have to pass that through a decider, which can be a little bit more expensive. It can be basically the same complexity as, as, as the predicate itself. And uh, the decider basically just makes sure that the, the final accumulator has the right state. Um, the, 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 the property of the system is that if all of these intermediate accumulation checks are correct and the final accumulator has been checked, well, then this implies that the, all of the, this is, has basically the equivalent properties, or it has, that this implies that all of the predicates would have been evaluated correctly. So basically, we re replace this task of t times running phi with t times running v, v is smaller, plus 1 times running d, which the goal is we did to design a system where this is significantly cheaper than running phi d times. Um, which is exactly what it says here. Um, so split accumulation kind of takes this to the ne next level and says, what if the, the, right, like the verifier has to read QI, 
And QI are, turns out in our systems, are going to be the intermediate snark proofs. But if these things are long, then, well, even reading them is not going to be efficient enough, right? We need this verifier to be highly efficient. So how can we do that? Well, this is where, where split accumulation comes in. So say we have a long, long, uh, now relations, not predicates, but like, and say we have l large statements for these relations, but we can split the statement into two parts in sort of so-called instance part and the witness part. And similarly, we can actually split the accumulator into a large part of the accumulator, the, uh, the, the, the entire accumulator, and the, the small subset of the accumulator, which is the instance. So again, the accumulator can be split into an instance and a witness. Well, then we can you know, use kind of a similar methodology as in SNARKs, where the, right, the verifier doesn't actually have to have access to the witness, and the witness could be much longer than the instance. It's basically the same thing, but for accumulation. Um, where now here, the accumulation verifier only gets access to the um, accumulator instance and to the, to the statement instance. And additionally, the prover now may provide an additional small proof saying that everything, that, saying that this update here was correct. Before there was no proof, now there's some additional uh, extra information that the prover can provide. Um, and it turns out that you know, now this, uh, the, the same property holds if the, I check all of, if the accumulation verifier was run correctly t times and the decider was run correctly, well then this implies that there exists witnesses such that all of these relations are, um, all of these instances are in the relation. So how do I build IVC from split accumulation? Well, the idea is gonna be that I have some NARC, so uh, prove or verify, blue is, is the NARC, and the NARC outputs a proof, but this proof can be split into a, a long part and a short part, and then the, the, the uh, so this is the, becomes the, the instance and this becomes the witness. And the NARC prover, the big difference here is now I only run the accumulation verifier, which takes much less input um, inside the recursive SNR code. So I've reduced the amount of information that has to go into the recursive circuit by saying I don't have to implement the NARC verifier inside the recursive circuit, this wouldn't even work because it's way too large. All I have to do is, uh, and I don't even have to feed the entire NARC into the recursive circuit. I only have to feed a small part of the uh, proof into the recursive circuit, and I only have to run this very efficient split accumulation verifier. So, um, yeah, uh, this, this is the, the accumulation scheme. I'll wrap up, uh, okay, I guess I've four more minutes, but um, what our theorem one says is that if you have a NARC, and if you have a split accumulation scheme, then this gives you IVC PCD. So our theorem one says that this construction is secure, and uh, it's the first construction of IVC that relies on non-succinct NARCs. Uh, the second thing that we do that I'll very quickly skip over is that we construct a NARC for, for R1CS with split accumulation schemes. So we show that this, uh, uh, is actually not just theoretically interesting, but that we can practically construct a very simple NARC. And uh, the NARC is, is, I just wanna show the NARC because it's, it's so simple, right? This is R1CS says that, you know, we have some vector Z and some public ma matrices A, B, and C. And basically what I prove in R1CS is that Z exists such that AZ times BZ is equal to CZ. So uh, the, the, NARC for R1CS is essentially just sending over, right, like the simplest NARC that always exists for any statement is just sending over the witness. This is a NARC, right? It is a non-interactive argument of knowledge. It's actually proof of knowledge, but whatever. Um, it's, but it doesn't have a lot of interesting other properties, but it's almost what we use. So what we really use is we simply, uh, and then you can just check that AZ times BZ is equal to CZ. What we do is we essentially do the same thing. So we send over Z, this is our NARC, but we also send commitments to AZ, BZ, and CZ, 
And these are going to be homomorphic commitments. So think a Patterson hash, uh, if you're familiar with that, or Patterson commitments. This is just going to be a vector commitment to all of these vectors. And uh, it turns out that we use these commitments to then accumulate these proofs. So our accumulation is going to be like, Smart research sounds really fancy, but all we really do is like take random linear combinations of things or uh, you know, some very simple polynomials. And this is essentially what we're going to do here. It's the, our split accumulation scheme. I won't have time to go into the detail, but it just takes the accumulator, which has this form, and it takes the new proof, which has this form, and then it takes a random linear combination between these two things. Just that's it. That's the accumulation scheme. And uh, the, the verification just has to check that you know, this was correctly. And in order to do that, the prover provides some cross terms here. So it sends you know, a few cross terms here to make sure that uh, this was done correctly. And it turns out that, that verifying this, so the verify only needs to compute three group scalar multiplication. So this is all the verification circuit does. It's three group scalar multiplication. This is the majority of the cross. And if you think three group scalar multiplications is pretty good, and it's hard to get below that, well, it turned out that there was a follow-up work called um, uh, NOVA, you know, shortly after us, which got this down to two group scalar multiplications. So 50% better. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's amazing, you know, it's amazing what's happening in this space. Um, but that is, you know, NOVA is also a split accumulation scheme for R1CS, um, but is able to get this down, you know, from something that we thought is as simple as it gets to something that somehow is even better. That's, it's amazing. But the other cool thing that holds both for this and also for NOVA is that this isn't really complicated, right? Like there, this is, I mean, you know, it's still math, it's complicated in that sense, but there's no FFTs, there's no PCPs, there's no fancy structured reference string, you know, that needs to be verified and <laughs> so on. Uh, it's just basically this one commitment thing uh, which you can instantiate from, from uh, for example, the discrete logarithm assumption. So theorem two says exactly that we can build this NARC for R1CS. And um, I'll, as I already mentioned, this is all implemented in, in ArcWorks. I want to you know, just show the, the one, the final prot, so, uh, which maybe is already outdated, but the, the gross 16, so recursive composition for gross 16, requires 250,000 constraints. Um, for BCMS or, or Halo type work, uh, we're starting at 250,000 and then it scales logarithmically. And for us, I guess uh, we're even below that. Uh, but yeah, about maybe, yeah, way less than that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this is sort of better on all fronts. It's, it's less constraints, less assumptions, less trusted setup. Um, and you know, really seems to be now the state of the art or ac split accumulation schemes. So this or Nova is really the state of the art of how to do recursive proofs. Um, so yeah, I think uh, there, this, there's some. I want to talk about you know, there's some open problems. For example, can we get rid of the random oracle? Can we construct post quantum secure thing? Can we get efficient accumulation schemes for other things like Planck and so on? I think there's still some really interesting open questions around this, but um, you know this really seems to get us, you know, make uh, recursive composition a lot more practical. Thank you very much. So I must say, I really like this, this construction, and especially in uh, Ethereum land, you know, we're bottlenecked for ZKVMs on, on prover performance, and here it seems like you have no FFTs, you have no parent-friendly curves, you have this, this tiny um, verifier circuit in the accumulation step, um, and you have really good constants on the MSMs. Uh, and this scheme is super simple. And so what I'm, I'm, I'm thinking here is like, have we reached a point of maturity where the proof system can maybe be implemented in hardware? Because we effectively have something that looks optimal from a simplicity and performance standpoint, which is what we want for hardware. Would you agree with that statement? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that um, you know, for certain applications, in, in particular, I think this is going to be used for verified delay functions. Um, you know, something like this or Nova really does seem quite optimal. I think where it's maybe lacking is in the flexibility. So the one thing that that kind of is shoved under the rug a little bit is that you require all of the for accumulation, you require all of the R1CS instances to be exactly the same, 
right? So you can prove the same function over and over again. But maybe you want to have some slight variations of that, or you want to have a little bit more complex things. And we don't have amazing ways yet of how to deal with that. There's some approaches, uh, but you know, I think that you know, maybe there's a little bit of work. But for something that really looks like IVC, and, and you know, I think one of the applications for that is, is, is VDFs, uh, I think you know, we're ready to burn things in. <laughs> maybe, I don't know. Like, uh, <laughs> Maybe, yeah, maybe quantum computers come out tomorrow and then we shouldn't burn things in, but yeah. Anyway. Abby? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go. I think yeah. he was first, uh, and then Abby yeah. can go. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, it's amazing work, uh, definitely. And I think that the initial problem that you sort of stated uh, on like building sort of clients which can actually do the like verification of the can consensus. Can you speak more into the microphone? Uh, like, uh, verification of the consensus is kind of very important. But so my question is like, you remove the succinctness out of the you know snarks, and then you, you provided other efficiency gains. Can you like talk about like how the you know I'm, I'm assuming the succinctness succinct, succinctness is removed from the proof sizes, and like how does it affect your proofs? Like how you know like how, with like increasing chain sizes or like increasing the yeah like how does it? Yeah, that's a very good question. So how does so you can see that the final proof size. It's, it's, you know, it's still constant size because even if I do t steps of computation, it's just basically the size of one step. But it could be in the megabytes, uh, or for evaluation, it was in the but megabytes. Isn't this succinct? Like, I mean, if, if it is the constant, then you, I mean, if you can exactly it. right. I mean, I think it, it depends on the implementation. What it also turns out is that um, you can basically, at the end, provide an additional proof on top of that. So you can just take the final output and give one more snark, now an actual snark, saying that the final state is correct. And that is exactly what they do in Nova. They provide a, a, a specialized snark for the decider to make the final proof uh, shorter. So, so basically, you can compress the final proof. It is constant size, but if your constant of one megabyte is too large for your application, then you can use one more snark to make it even, even, even that constant smaller. So where did you actually remove the succinct part? I mean, it's, I mean, I'm still trying to understand that, like, is it succinct? Like, I mean, is it succinct or is it not succinct? Uh, the final output is succinct in the dependence. Basically, there's two dependencies, right? The one dependence is on the number of steps of the computation. Right. And what we're able to show is that it's independent of the number of steps of the computation. It is linear in the size of each computation step. That is how it's not succinct. Right, like there's two dimensions, the size of each computation step and the number of steps. So f and t, it's right. independent of t, yeah. which is really what you care about, right. it turns out. It is not independent of f, but it seems like that is OK uh, for many applications. I see. OK, cool. Thanks. Thank you. So, so in your construction, you didn't need to prove that z and commitment of az was consistent? And yeah. So, so in, in, in the construction, essentially what we do is, right, uh, instead of directly checking that, that um, you know, az times bz is equal to cz, we just do this random linear, com we defer that check until the very end, right? So all we do is apply the same linear combination which ensures that basically the same, you know, sure, but y and z. z what? The reason Z needs to be sent was for extraction, for soundness? Um, yeah, in the end, the, the extractor will recover Y prime. And then you need to, in the final check, basically make sure that the same Y is being used. So you only check this consistency at the end. But because you do the same linear operation on everything, it's like completeness holds. If it's complete in the beginning, then uh, it will well, both completeness and extraction holds. So, so if I know that this is the correct y prime, then it turns out I can co recover the z and the correct z and y um, in the extraction step. Maybe this is, we can maybe take this offline. I think this is getting too. Okay, uh, but it is interesting that the split accumulation, your framework doesn't require proof of consistency between the actual NARC and the split accumulation system. Yeah, I mean, essentially, things are being pushed into the witness, right? You can, that's one way to think of it, is that uh, you know, the, the Z or the Y, they live in the witness. And only at the very, very end, in the decider, in this final step, I check that it's correct. 
But this implies, by recursive extraction, that all of the previous witnesses had the right consistency. So something like that. Okay. Well done, time. Thank you so much, Benedict. Okay. Thank you very much.